So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Uh, my name is Reverend Joanna Bartlett, and I'm a certified grief recovery specialist. And the first thing I want you guys to do is give yourself a little pat on the back or a little round of applause or just a thank you to yourself, because showing up for somebody who's going to talk to you about grief, like, that takes courage. It really does. It, it honestly does. And so I am... I'm proud of all of you just for being here and doing something to learn more about grief or to help yourselves begin to move through grieving because it's a big deal. It's, it's hard. So I'm not completely sure how long I'm going to be talking to you this evening. I haven't like timed this or anything. I know what I need to share and what I want to share with you. Um, if you get too wriggly, um, we can like have a little break or we can, you know, if you don't, then we can keep going. If you need to use the facilities, this is the fun housekeeping bit at the beginning. Um, the bathrooms are right through the door where you, where you entered, and that's probably about all you need to know, other than, you know, please don't get on Facebook or talk to people while, while we're doing this this evening. And um, yeah, if you could silence your phones or put them on vibrate, that would be, that would be super. So a little bit about me. So I'm a certified grief recovery specialist uh, with the Grief Recovery Institute, which is actually based in Bend, Oregon. Um, and so that means that I've, well, I'm also, and I'm also a minister. I'm a spiritualist minister with the National Spiritualist Association of Churches. And so I've, I did uh, grief, you know, bereavement training during my pastoral skills training. And then also with the Grief Recovery Institute, I have learned even more about grief and how to actually help people effectively move through the process of grief and loss. I'll tell you more about my own personal grief recovery story in a little bit, but the short story of my own work really with the grief recovery method. But the way I came to it is that I'm also a certified medium which means that I communicate with people who are no longer in physical bodies. And people would come to me to connect in with their loved ones who are in spirit because, and that's how people will often find mediumship and spiritualism is in that way because they've, they've experienced the loss and they really want to connect in with their loved one because they still have all this unresolved and incomplete stuff in their relationship. And for some people I found that connecting in with their loved one was really all they needed and that would help them move toward, you know, move forward on that path of healing. And that's one of the reasons I did mediumship work. I'm not offering readings currently. But what I found for some people is that that wasn't enough. That didn't, they would still, they just didn't know what to do, even then. Even if they knew their loved one was okay, they were still very much stuck in like this life. And so I started looking for ways to help people because I wanted to help, you know, my clients I care about. And so I found the Grief Recovery Handbook, which I think I completely forgot to bring with me somehow. And um, the Grief Recovery, and I started using this method, you know, for myself and going, oh, this is really cool. And then also became certified so I could actually help people move through grief. So. Grief is something that we do not talk about. It is, I think, the most off-limits topic of conversation. I recently went to, like, we have to have special places to talk about grief, and I recently went to a thing called a death cafe, which was pretty cool. We, we, just, we just sat around these tables and chatted about death for an hour, and it was actually really refreshing. I thought it was really cool. But we have to, like, have this special thing to do that. We don't get to talk about it the rest of the time with people. It makes people really uncomfortable to talk about grief, to talk about death, um, and to talk about our feelings, especially our feelings around grief and loss. So the definition of grief that I am using, so that we're all on the same page, is that grief is the normal and natural reaction to loss. It is normal and natural. It is also the conflicting feelings caused by the end of or change in a familiar pattern of behavior. So when you have some pattern of behavior in your life that you're familiar with, which could be a relationship with somebody, it could be a job, it could be a place that you live, it could be your health, it could be your financial status, and that changes or ends, you experience grief. And so there are so many ways that we experience grief and loss. So there are more than like 40 
types of losses that cause grief. Most often when we think about grief, we think about death, right? We think about a loved one dying and the grief that naturally arises because of that. The grief also happens because of all kinds of things, other things such as uh, divorce, abuse, loss of trust, loss of safety, financial changes, moving, retiring, even graduating high school for some people or college can be a grief event because it's changed what they were used to and familiar with. It's changed because they have no idea what to do. Now that this thing has happened, having children can cause grief because it's a huge change in your life and in the pattern of behavior that you're used to having. And that's if you have a you know, lovely, healthy child, let alone if there's if you have a miscarriage or stillbirth or all kinds of other other ways that we that we grieve. So I'm going to talk about a few of these ways of, of a few of these reasons that we grieve. So loved ones. How many people here have had a loved one die in the last, say, five or so years? Yeah. And how many of you? within, I don't know, 30 seconds even, or a day, realize that you are completely inequipped to deal with this loss. That you did not have the tools to really deal with this loss. You haven't been taught them. And then, when you talk to other people about your loss, about this you know, conflicting mass of emotions that you're feeling, because of your because of your loved one died. You know, how long did it take you to realize that they had no real idea how to help you either? Because we we don't know. I mean, like when somebody we, we have a friend, like we have a friend on Facebook that says, Oh, my, my mother in law just passed, or my brother, or my grandparent, or whoever, it's like, well, I want to help. I want to be helpful, but we have no idea what to say. And most often, which I will talk about a bit more later, we say completely, not generally people say very useless and sometimes harmful things, and it's because that's what we've been taught. It's not because we're trying to do anything wrong, it's just that's what we've been taught. So how about not-so-loved ones? Because I'm probably not the only person who has a not-so-loved one that we had a difficult relationship with. You know, in the last, say, 10 years or so, we had a, had a anybody had a, a not-so-loved one pass a die? Somebody, you know, it was, it was difficult. It was, yeah, did it hurt any less? No. Yeah, just because you, because you maybe had a harder relationship with them didn't mean that that grief kind of was any less. How moving, did anybody move before they were the age of 15? Yeah? Did your parents tell you that you would go back to like visit your old friends, like if you moved to a new town or school or anything? No, because many parents will do that, but then you know you never actually go back to, to visit your old friends. Remove schools, right? If you change schools, then you, you lose those friendships. That's loss. That's grief right there. And if you're not given the tools to really process it and move through it, usually you'll, we'll talk about some of the myths of grief, the misinformation that we're taught. Usually you'll get, in, you know, your people in your life will tell you things like, oh, don't worry, you'll make new friends. It'll be fine, it's a better house, it's a better school, it's a better job, it's a better whatever, which doesn't address the grief that you're experiencing. Death of relationships. So, who here is still happily with their first love? No one? Oh, are your first love ever, your first crush? That's wonderful. So my first love, my first crush was Michael J. Fox. <laughs> We're not together. It's so sad. And then I went and moved on to Morton Harkett from a hall, you know, take on me. That guy could sing really high. Totally in love with him. And I realized, you know, there wasn't a real relationship. Well, everybody around will like minimize that. That's not a real relationship. Oh my God, to my 10-year-old self, I was so in love with him. And when I realized that these things were never going to work out, that, I mean, honestly, that was a loss. Or even, say, your first, you know, actual romantic, you know, with a real person in your life relationship, not your crush on a star. Um, probably not still with that person. 
And yet, when you, when that relationship ended, for whatever reason, you know, what maybe were some of the things around you that you heard? Was it like, oh yes, you're experiencing grief, or was it like, oh that was just puppy love? There's just plenty of fish in the sea, right? The things that we hear are not particularly helpful, often. And the thing with grief is that grief builds up and it accumulates. So it's like with relationships. I'm on my third marriage. I keep trying. That's what I say about myself. I just keep on trying. And I've had lots of other romantic relationships, you know, before and kind of during, uh, you know, in between those marriages. And I know that for me, every you know, new relationship that I have entered into, I've taken that kind of fear. And the, you know, the fear of being hugged again. God, yeah, going into my third marriage and going to the, you know, the city hall to fill out the marriage license. I'm thinking, are they actually going to let me? Are they going to be like, no, you've used up all your tries at this. You need to just stop. Like, what if I fail again? You know, we bring all of this stuff into it because I hadn't, you know, completely resolved all of my unfinished emotional stuff from all those prior relationships. We, we keep trying, but we keep taking into each new relationship, the hurts and the losses that we haven't resolved from the prior one. And so grief builds up, it accumulates, and it accumulates negatively. And I think this is why we don't like talking about grief, and why we feel really uncomfortable when people around us are grieving, is because it pushes our buttons, it pushes on all the sore and tender spots that we have inside ourselves from all the unresolved stuff that we just, we don't know how to deal with. And so we don't want to know. It's like, oh, this is too painful because this is bringing up all of my stuff. It's resonating with our own hearts. And so it, it, it feels bad. And the other piece is we just, we haven't been, we've been taught. And so the grief recovery method, which is what I'm talking about and what I work with, can help you resolve all kinds of emotional loss, in unfinished business, whatever it is, whether that is, you know, the death of a loved one or not so loved one, divorce, um, you know, loss of health or abuse that you've trauma that you've experienced in your life, it can applied in slightly different ways, but using the same method, actually address all of these different kinds of losses. I know this because I am doing this for myself. I am not asking anybody to do anything that I am not personally doing. So I think as a society, we are generally completely unprepared to deal with loss. We're just not taught the tools how to do it, which is really kind of interesting because if you came early, you saw this lovely pile of branches <laughs> over the walkway, because apparently there's been tree trimming going on today, unbeknownst to me, not that I expected anybody to inform me, but um, and so, you know, you have to like walk over it until, thank you, everybody who helps to drag it all out of the way. I appreciate the, the community effort in that. Um, so say one of us, which thankfully, really thankfully did not happen, say one of us tripped over one of those branches and fell and like broke a leg. What would you do? Hopefully one of us would call 911, right? Or if they just got like a cut or a scrape, you'd be like, you know, is there a first aid kit around? Because we should probably wash this off and, you know, put a bandage on it. We know what to do when we break our bodies. We don't know what to do when our hearts get broken. Because we're not taught. So rather than, you know, life, society, our parents, everybody, teaching us how to heal from grief. Unfortunately, instead, we're taught some wrong information. And what happens, you've probably heard this analogy before, but it's one of a, a tape recorder. Essentially, like our brains are installed with this tape recorder inside. And from the kind of the moment of our birth, essentially, we're running this tape recorder. We're recording things. We're recording information um, from the people around us, from our parents, our caregivers, our teachers, you know, all those kinds of people. And we're learning from them, we're recording it, and then for most of us, I think, and for me, it was right back in our minds, over and over and over again, when anything happens, it's kind of relevant to the thing that we have information on, on the hard, or tape recorder hard drive. Maybe we have solid state hard drives now, we've upgraded it, 2018. Um, we replay this information. 
So some of these myths of grief, or the, the things that you're most likely to hear from the people around you, and that you've probably been taught as you've been growing up when loss happens in your life. The first one is, don't feel bad. So don't know if you've ever come home from school when you were a kid and you had a bad day. Or even as an adult, maybe you had a bad day at your job and you tell your parents or a loved one or somebody, oh my God, it was such a bad day, like well, such and such happened. You know, as a kid, maybe somebody wouldn't play with you or they were sick or they, you know, so they weren't there and you didn't have anyone to eat lunch with. As an adult, you know, maybe something, I don't know, went wrong at work. And you tell this to somebody that you love and that you trust, and they say, oh, don't feel bad. Tomorrow will be better. Tomorrow is a new day. Or as a kid, perhaps, oh, don't feel bad. Here, have a cookie. You know, feel better. It's okay. Feel bad. Don't feel bad. Feel better. And while the person telling you this may be really well-meaning, because I've done this to my own children, which now I feel kind of terrible about, which is okay. I can feel bad, right? It's okay that I've done this. Um, and I've done it from a place of love. I've done it because I don't want them to feel bad. I want them to feel good. I want to make them feel better. I want to give them reason and intellect. You know, Susie will be at school tomorrow. Oh, you, this fight will blow over. Don't worry about it. Or we'll buy you a new bike. We'll buy you, you know, like we'll fix this. I want to fix it for them. And it totally erases and minimizes what they're actually feeling because they still feel bad. And so when you take this into, say, a larger kind of grief event, such as the loss of a loved one, you're going to feel bad. You're supposed to feel bad. Grief is a normal and natural reaction to loss. You, it, it, you're human, right? You're not robots. Like, it's normal to be, like, crying and feeling awful and staring off into space or whatever it is. Like, that's a totally normal reaction. So try to like tamp it down, stick this back in the box. This is ungainly. I don't want to deal with this emotion. It's not helpful to you. It doesn't help you move through those feelings. Another one is to replace the loss. So for instance, the, um, the writers of the Grief Recovery Handbook, John James and Russell Friedman, and I think it was John who tells a story about when he was a kid and somebody stole his bike. And as a kid, you know, he was like eight or nine years old. And it was a big deal because like, that was his bike. He loved his bike. And his parents, in an, in, a, in an effort to make him feel better, said, don't feel bad. We'll buy a new bike on Saturday. He was still upset about the bike that he had lost because it was a loss to him. And so people will actually say things like, say if you are a woman who has had a miscarriage, and you tell people, and they'll say, don't feel bad, you can have plenty more kids. Oh. People will actually say this to people that have lost a child and say, well, don't worry, you're healthy. Like, you can make another kid. Mm. Like, you can't, but you can't replace that loss. It's, it, that doesn't help you move through grief, but it's what, what we're taught. Grieve alone is another one. So, as you might be able to tell from my accent, which kind of comes and goes, it's interesting. It's a little mysterious to me. I'm originally from England, and I was taught, you know, to be English, stiff up a lip, and all that. Like seriously, like you do not show emotion. If you are gonna cry, go to your room. Nobody wants to hear it. Or I'll give you something to cry about. Perhaps you've heard that one. Another one of my, I think my parents' favorites was uh, that I heard a lot as a kid because I was a bit of a crybaby. I was an, I had, I had a difficult childhood. I had. I had real things to cry about. Um, was smile in the world smiles with you, cry and you cry alone. So don't feel bad, and if you're gonna do it, go do it on your own because nobody wants to be around you when you're crying. But grieving alone, it doesn't really help you. So when I went to um, the group, my grief recovery specialist training, <clears throat> even though I'd like done all this work around you know grief recovery for myself and I think this is funny. Looking back, I think this is funny because I have actually, I've changed and shifted even since then. I actually said, but I like to grieve alone. Like, I think that's just part of my personality. I think that's just how I am. I don't, I don't hate crying in front of other people. Well, it's not really. It's because I've been taught to be afraid to show emotion in front of other people and that it's unacceptable to show emotion in front of other people. 
even if I'm talking about something that's really hard for me, or that re was really difficult, or had a huge impact in my life. We're not taught to, you know, it's, it's what we're taught. So that's what you, that's kind of how you learn to behave, because you want people to like you and accept you and not, you know, kick you out of the clan and the family. Another one is to be strong for others. Yeah, we have some strong people here, don't we? I think if, you know, if strength, like if internal fortitude and strength was something that you could physically see, I'd be like a bodybuilder. I think a lot of us would be like huge. Because we've, we've been taught to be strong when something happens. It's to, you know, to, it's like my mom died. It's like, well, I have to like go through her stuff. I have to keep it together. I still have four kids. I'm working. I've got a husband. Got to keep going. You know, got to keep, got to keep moving through it. Being, being strong. But me being strong on the outside doesn't help everything that's going on on the inside. It just builds walls. Really, it's just building this external facade that's not helping me deal with any of the things that are going on within me. One of the ways I think that we try to kind of be strong is to stay busy. Just keep busy, just keep doing stuff. I'm really good at this one. Super awesome at staying busy. Pack my schedule full of things, write to-do lists. I was laid off from my job, a job that I really loved in uh, summer of 2013. And it was devastating to me. And I knew, like, part of me intuitively knew that it was going to be okay and it was ultimately a blessing and I had gotten to that point but it took me I think a good two years before I felt kind of like I had emotionally healed and worked through it and moved through it before I recovered from that loss and I used my job to stay busy a lot I talked to my like even when my mom um, my mom died about seven years ago and she passed you know very quickly and I took, I don't know, a week or so off work maybe. I used the amount, they gave you, they give you like what, a couple bereavement days or something. If you're lucky, if you have a nice employer, maybe you get like three bereavement days because your mother has died. Um, and then like other people donated some PTO to me. So I actually, cause I didn't like have any. And so I took, you know, maybe a week or so off and I, you know, I was busy, I packed up all her stuff. I was really good. I sold it all, I had an estate sale. I, I went back to work and I just kept going and I just like, yeah, okay, well, that's not going to help you deal with the loss. And I did the same thing after I, after I was laid off and lost my job. Um, I was so productive that summer because I wanted to like prove myself that I was still worth something and I had all these house projects and garden projects and I did them all and then I started a business and then I, oh, it's exhausting. It's all exhausting just talking about it. But it didn't, it didn't heal that loss from from not having the job that I truly, truly loved doing. And then the last grief myth is to give it time. Maybe, possibly, heard the saying, time heals all wounds. It doesn't. Time alone does not heal anything. If, say, one of us, who fortunately doesn't, had that broken leg and was laying there on the sidewalk in pain with like, you know, bone dip sticking out, not to get too gruesome. Uh, <laughs> would we just say, eh, give it time, it'll get better, don't worry about it, it's fine. No, like that would be hard, like, <laughs> I hope not. I hope none of you would do that and you would actually call 911. Um, <laughs> we're not gonna say, oh, just give it, give it some time. Like we do something about it, you know. And so action alone doesn't fix it, time alone doesn't fix it fix it time plus the right actions which would be calling 911 going to the hospital having a, maybe some surgery a cost you know physical therapy whatever the things i have, I have fortunately have not broken any bones um other than my toe but you know those things would help that bone heal and it's the same thing for grief really time on its own is not going to do it so Let's see, has anybody here had any losses that we've talked about, say that 10 or more years ago, a loved one that's died, a job that you've lost, a relationship that's ended, that still maybe hurt? Mm -hmm. 
Do you think if time was going to heal it, it would have done it by now? But it hasn't. And it's okay. So it's okay because there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. That's the thing I really want you to, to walk away, you know. There's nothing wrong with you. You were totally normal. You haven't had the right tools or education, perhaps, or known how to apply them if you have had them, and it's okay. I mean, that I think is the majority of people. So some of the ways that we do try and deal with grief are what the Grief Recovery Institute calls STIRBS, which I think is a weird acronym. It used to be, well, so it stands for Short Term Energy Relieving Behaviors. It used to be short-term feeling-relieving feeling relieving behaviors, which I personally think is better than, because there are things that we do to try to relieve our feelings of loss and grief that are short-term. So some of these, you may be familiar with them. Some is eating, perhaps, comfort eating, alcohol, or other substances of one kind or another, prescription, non-prescription, illegal, illegal. Isolation, making yourself alone, protecting, your, protecting yourself. Fantasy, like what's the next book, or TV, or the internet, social media. It's, I am a total geek, nerd, love, the, love gadgets, love the internet, love the whole thing, and will also admit, internet, Facebook, total distraction, total weight, like I'm not feeling good, Instead of like dealing with that, I seriously I'm trying to catch myself now. But I know I have spent way too much time. If I'm not feeling good, oh let's see if I have any Facebook notifications. Oh, what are people talking about? It's a total way to distract myself from what's going on within me. And so we do these things. It's even exercise for some people can be a short-term way of trying to relieve these feelings that they are having, these unresolved feelings of grief. Which, you know, exercise can be a healthy thing, right? Totally can be good for you, has good, you know, physiological, psychological benefits. Overdone, not so good. It's just if it's something you're using to distract yourself from what's really going on with you, not so awesome. But the thing with all of these kinds of behaviors, and you can probably think of some more and, and name some more for yourself, is that even after you relieve these feelings of grief or distract yourself from them, once you stop doing that thing, the grief is still there. It hasn't gone away. You've just distracted yourself from it for a bit. But it's still there. So you still have to deal with it at some point, hopefully, in your life, if you want to feel better. So your inner nature as a person, as a human being, is really, and you may not believe me when I say this, but it is to be loving giving, nurturing, trusting, and trustful. That's who you really are. It may not be how you feel right now, but when you were born, and you're a brand new, beautiful baby. That's why I think when we love babies, right? You get, oh, you look at a newborn baby, and you just go, oh, the potential, like the whole like, universe is there. They have not, they're, they're, you know, we say innocent, but, I think that innocence is really this clean slate where like none of the things have happened yet, none of the losses or grief or the stuff has happened and you just go, oh, I just want to soak up that beauty. But that's who you really are. That's who within you, that is who you really are. And you can get back to feeling that way and experiencing that kind of aliveness within yourself and in your life again, and that lightness within yourself. So how many times have you woken up in the morning and your brain just starts going, as soon as you wake up, starts going, starts thinking, starts worried out, go war, war it up, gets into gear, and it keeps going around. And like by the time you even get in the shower, perhaps, you've convinced yourself that the world is this hostile place where you have to protect and defend yourself at all times, <coughs> right? We've got to protect ourselves from these bad things in life. That's not how you were born. 
It's not the way that you were born, and it's not the way that you're meant to be and the way you're meant to live. <coughs> but again, there's nothing wrong with you. You feel the way that you feel right now because of all the things that you've experienced and the things that you've learned about how to deal with those experiences. And if you learned things that weren't helpful, well, of course you didn't, like, move through them easily or completely. How could you? Like, you probably wouldn't expect that of anybody else, right? If you, I don't know, you're teaching a, a kid math or something, and, and you're teaching them that, you know, 2 plus 2 is 5. You don't expect them to get to, like, 2 plus 2 is 4. Like, if they haven't been taught that, they've been taught something different, which in this case would be incorrect. So we touched a bit before on how, you know, the things that people say after you have experienced loss in your life are essentially stupid and unhelpful. And there was actually uh, a study that was done, a research project, a bunch of years ago now, and I unfortunately don't have the name of the organization, which I would love to be able to give to you because I like, you know, actual science, not like, oh, there is a study that said blah, blah, blah. But I believe the people that told me about this was at the Grief Recovery Inst Institute, which is why I'm sharing it. And so this study showed that there are 141 comments that are so common that within the first three days after somebody experiences a loss, there is a 95% chance that that person has heard at least one of these comments. Okay? So this is quiz time for you. It's a pop quiz, I guess, because they didn't give you any study materials. What percentage of those comments do you think was helpful? Or how many of those comments, out of the 141 comments, do you think were actually helpful to the person grieving? Three. Wow, you're even more like pessimistic than I am about this. Um, so <coughs> 141 comments that you're going to hear at least one of within three days after a loss are helpful, which leaves 122 that are not helpful. Isn't that lovely? So it's 85% of the things that you're going to hear after you have some kind of tragedy or loss in your life and not going to be helpful things to you. It's like, well, of course. Like how, like, how would you know how to move forward? And also, the way that we um, act, right, after a loss has occurred. Like, see me with my mom, right? I, you know, I took some time off. I, I, I dealt with all the things. I went back to work. I'm fine. Right? I pretend to be fine because the people around me want me to be fine. So how many people here like to get compliments from other people? Or like other people? How many people like to be liked? Who wants to be liked by other people? I want to be liked by other people. I will admit it. I want other people. I'm working on like being okay with not being liked by people. I'll admit it. I want people to like me. I want you to think I'm nice or I'm helpful, I'm friendly, you know? And so because of this, you know, if everybody around you is telling you like unhelpful things or basically telling you that you should get over it, it's like, okay, you can have another kid or, you know, your mom, oh, well, she at least she passed quickly or some other, you know, very unhelpful intellectual comment. It's like, well, yes, that's true. And she's also dead now. <laughs> you start acting like you were recovered. You start acting like you're okay because people expect you to be okay. So, a little audience participation time. What's your name in the front? Diane. And how are you doing? Okay. And what, what's your name? Teresa. And what, how are you doing tonight? Hanging in. And Michelle, right? Michelle. What's your name? I know what's your name. You just said your name. Jesus, Joanna. And how are you doing? Yeah, that's good. And how are you doing tonight? Well, I'm wondering what those 19 comments were. <laughs> 19 helpful comments? <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can mention some of them. So how many of you, if I walk up to you at some point and say, hey, how are you doing? How many of you say I'm fine? Yeah, so how many of you, again, have experienced 
of the loss of a loved one or a grief event in the last like five years or so. Yeah, and are you still experiencing maybe feelings of isolation or hurt or pain or a lot of sadness when that comes up? You're not fine. But we tell people we are because that's what we think they want to hear. I actually go around, I usually say, I'm still here because I feel like I've done it. And people think I'm like being depressing. I'm like, no, it's factual. <laughs> I'm still here. I actually, for some people, I mean, at some points in my life, I mean, that's a triumph. I'm still here. It's, and it's factual. Because I'm, I'm not always fine. And it's okay to not be fine. And I want you to know that. So some of the helpful things um, that you can say to somebody who has experienced a loss. I mean, even simple things like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for your loss. I can't imagine how that feels, or I can only even be, I can only begin to imagine how that feels. What happened? How did it happen? Because people who are experiencing grief actually want to talk about it. We think we don't want to say anything. We don't want to remind them, right? But say if your child has died, the thing that's really hurtful, or your spouse, or your whoever, the thing that's actually really hurtful is that people won't talk to you about it. It's like that becomes a not like this is the subject we're sticking in a box. I'm not going to talk about it. But you actually want to talk about it. I want to talk about my mom. I love my mom. She was, it would be her birthday on Thursday. We're going to get desserts from Sweet Life and talk about her and tell stories about her. The things that we love, the things that drove me crazy, because I, like, you know, I like to keep it real. And because she was a real person, she was a whole person. I don't need to memorialize her. Um, but those kinds of comments, you know, those kinds of responses that you can give to people. Sometimes just a hug. Sometimes just, you know, letting people know that they have a safe, compassionate space to be where there's going to be somebody that is just willing to listen, who doesn't try to fix it, who doesn't change the topic of, you know, the conversation topic and say, okay, well, this is, how's the weather? How's the, did you see the Ducks game or whatever, right? So I bet many of you, like me, probably have a, you know, a go-to-work face, or a go-to-church face, or a go-to-a-meeting face, right, that you put on so that everybody thinks that you're fine. And so the Grief Recovery Institute, they call this an Academy Award-winning recovery. <laughs> because it's just so, so splendid and wonderful. You could get an award for it. That's okay. So a little bit about my story and how I found the grief, well I told you about how I found the grief recovery method, but I guess how I've been using it in my life and why I, I, I'm so interested in it. I'm really actually really passionate about it. I'm not usually a very kind of excited, like passionate, like, oh, this is the best thing ever kind of person, but, and I am about this and that's kind of curious to me. So, oh, what's the, con the condensed version of all the bad things that have happened to Joanna? Um, so my parents divorced when I was, well they split when I was four, I got a stepmother who I had a very difficult relationship with, my older half brother died when I was two, I'm not going in order, sorry, don't have, I don't have my like timeline in front of me, um, I didn't have a good relationship with my dad, he was very cold and not emotionally unavailable, perhaps because my brother died, you know, and he had a whole lot of grief himself, now I can kind of go, oh, oh, uh, hmm. Um, what I was, oh, I was sexually assaulted when I was seven by, I don't even remember it still, I, I know it happened. Um, when I was 10, I moved to Barbados from England. I moved with my mom and so I left my home. And what happened, which I didn't realize at the time that was gonna happen, was I was essentially exiled. I felt exiled from my home. My dad wouldn't let me go back and visit. It was too complicated for my stepmom. Oh, I had a little baby sister as well that I wasn't allowed to hold or like touch or anything because it's like too germy. Um, so it's another loss there. Uh, Cause I always wanted a sister. I always wanted that kind of relationship. And I wasn't allowed to have it. I experienced unfortunately a lot of sexual harassment and assault growing up in Barbados. Um, I don't like even know kind of the numbers repeatedly. Some from people I knew and was close to and some from people, you know, that I wasn't, often my mom's boyfriend. Um, hmm, let's see, what happened after that? Oh, I had to leave Barbados suddenly when I was 14 
our visas were not renewed. And so again, I had to leave my home. It was really unexpected and hugely traumatic for me. Actually, it was a very difficult experience. Haven't finished, quite finished my work with that one yet, I'll be honest. I'm going to do it. It's on the list. Definitely doing it. Haven't made it there yet. Um, I also experienced kind of the loss of growing up with my brother when I moved to Barbados because he stayed in England with my dad and my stepmom and my little sister. And so it changed our relationship a whole lot. Uh, the experience, oh, sexual assault. Yay, I apparently have a giant target on me during my kind of teenage years and young adult years. I got married when I was 19. That was an excellent idea. Got divorced. There we go. That's another loss. And there's been like relationships, you know, losses and things kind of along the way. Uh, I was going to start an intentional community, actually, in the, in the Western North Carolina mountains when I was 19 years old. Seemed like a great idea at the time. Didn't work out at all. And uh, honestly, I mean, it was, it was a loss for me. And so, you know, that's a, and so that takes me until I'm like 23. So I have lots of grief recovery work to do. So my mom died um, a few years ago of pets, you know, that have died. Pet loss is actually a huge source of grief for a lot of people that they don't, that we totally minimize. It's like, eh, it's a cat, it's just a dog. It's like all the other pet lovers, perhaps, that say, oh, I'm so sorry, I know how much you love it, I'm very baby. But for most of us, it's like, we can get another one. We can replace that loss. Don't feel bad, you can replace that loss. And if you're going to like be weird about your pet, just go over there. Don't, it's just too, too much to be around everybody else. So, so you've had a fun, fun sampling of things that happened to me. But I tell you this so that you know Grief, you know, has happened and loss has happened in my life. And I've tried a lot of things over the years to deal with it. There's the not dealing with it. There's the getting in yet another relationship, another marriage, another, you know, thing, distraction, something to try to replace it and not deal with it. Um, there's contemplating suicide, you know, so that seemed like an option a couple times in my life. Again, I'm still here, it really is, sometimes, a, you know, an act of stubbornness and triumph on my own part. I'm not feeling that way now, don't worry. But at times in my life, it's been very difficult. Um, tried alcohol for a while, and I'm just not really very alcohol tolerant, so that didn't work very well. So I tried to distract myself in, in lots of different ways. And then I've had a lot of, a lot of oh, therapy, a lot of mental health counseling, which I completely believe in. I'm super supporter of mental health care. I think it is excellent and wonderful. And if that's something that feels right for you, totally go and do it. However, for me, I found that no matter how much I talked about certain things, didn't really change what was unfinished and unresolved inside of me. I've tried a, a variety of um, kind of body work and like Bowen and some somatic kind of therapy and craniosacral work and. Um, tension and trauma release exercises, which are supposed to help kind of like release the trauma um, through you intentionally make yourself kind of tremor and shake, which made my back like spasm really badly. I think I was trying to like release too much at once and a little impatient about the whole thing, but it, I think it was too much kind of for me to process. Um, oh, and uh, EDMR, I, I tried that and found it um, really overwhelming. Couldn't stick it out. I think it can be totally effective for some people, and it was just again maybe too much for me. You know, it was, I had experienced too much, or it just wasn't the right fit, or or whatever. I tried, I tried all the things. I went up depth journaling. I got into that earlier this year to try and release my subconscious rage, which it turns out I actually have quite a lot of. And hopefully now it's all released. But <laughs> I'm like, wow, who knew how much fury lies beneath this seemingly fine exterior? <sighs> and so then I found the grief recovery method. And it has just been this, for me, it's been this huge, refreshing, oh, just relief to go, oh my god, this is something that I can actually use and apply and walk through, and I understand the work that I have to do, and I understand how to do it, and I can do it. And so, a 
I'll tell you a little bit about the grief recovery method because um, you know, one of the things I do as a certified grief recovery ther specialist is um, I offer one-on-one -on -one work with people that want to work with me privately and then I offer, also offer a support group class. It's an eight-week group and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that and this is one of the reasons you know I am having this event this evening is to tell people more about the work that I do and I also hope that you're going to leave here with useful good information regardless of whether you ever work with me you can also I will say if you're feeling very brave and um, like motivated you can get the grief recovery handbook and you can work through much of it yourself which is what I did to begin with before I did the training so they recommend that you find at least a partner or that you find a support group or you find you know, a specialist to work with one-on-one. -on -one. And I will tell you, however you find healing, it's fine with me. I mean, it's awesome. You know, if you, you want to do the work, yeah, it's great. However you want to do it is absolutely wonderful. So the Reef Recovery Method, it has been in use for about 40 years. Um, and it's been used by more than a half million people worldwide to move through grief and loss and heal from it. And it was developed by John W. James, who, after he lost his son, who was an infant, and thought that he could not possibly ever feel whole again, he read essentially all the books, he says, on grief that were available, and didn't find anything that, that, you know, there were things that were very helpful and supportive and like, you know, this is why you feel this way and it's normal to feel this way, but there's nothing that said, okay, now this is what you do about it. And so I'm not completely sure how he figured out this is what you do about it. I think he's actually a very intuitive man and got some of this information through his intuition, but that's much of my personal theory. It is, it is a proven method. It is effective. It is doable. It um, is, they call it this action-oriented education program, which basically, um, whether you're working kind of by yourself or one-on-one -on -one with me or in a support group, you, you, get, you get some information each week, which is like a re-education about grief and the things that you've learned and felt and everything about grief. And then you get this doable action step that you do with your homework, and then you take, you know, and then you come back the next week and we talk about that bit, and you get another little action step. And it takes you in these nice, nice kind of bite-sized pieces to help you complete one unfinished relationship in your life. And so it doesn't like fix everything in eight weeks. Unless you, if you only have one unfinished relationship, that it does fix everything, that's awesome. But uh, I didn't. And so I have a list. I actually have a list. I'm working through my list. And it, what I love about it is that not only do you learn how and actually go through the process of completing one unfinished, incomplete relationship in your life, but you learn the tools as to how to do it with every other one in your life as well. So you can complete all of your incomplete loss. So it teaches you how to do it and it helps you look at grief differently. There was something actually right when I got home from the, the grief recovery training I was away for a few days, and I left the kids with my you know, husband number three. And um, <laughs> it's great. We have a blended family. We have four kids. It's, it's a good. It's a good deal. It's I totally, totally locked out on this, on this one. So time's a try, charm, right? Sure. Yeah. So try to charm. Anyway, I found out something that was really difficult and upsetting to me and scary to me about one of my kids and how they were feeling and the anxiety they were feeling and what was happening as a result of that. And, you know, I just come back fresh from this training and I went, oh, this is a grief event for me. That what I'm experiencing, this loss in terms of the kind of this change in a familiar pattern of behavior, which is feeling, believing that my kids are safe and okay. It's a change in that. This is, this is grief for me. And just knowing that really helped me. It didn't change the situation. But it helped me, it helped me move through it in a more powerful and centered and balanced and grounded way, which just helps everybody in the situation, right? And so it really can change how you react to things in your life and how you feel. You know, for me, I feel so much lighter within myself 
that like after I started doing this work, I would kind of look at myself and I'd go, huh, I'm surprised I don't weigh less because I feel so much lighter. I feel, I felt like I was before I was this like tangled ball of yarn with all these kind of different you know, compass threads running through it and all like tangled up together. And then I would, you know, work on a relationship and complete it. And it's like pulling that one thread out. Pulling a thread out. And it created, you know, creating space inside so that you can see what's really going on in there. And you can just begin to feel kind of that spaciousness. I will say, actually, this summer I lost 20 pounds. And I can't say it's from doing recovery work. I changed my diet. But I do wonder. Like, I literally, I feel, felt lighter within myself. I am now literally lighter than I was. It's pretty amazing. And I think, I think it all goes together, personally. I think when we seek to make change in our life, that um, things happen. Things come into our life that, what, that help us, that help us move, help us move forward and what, you know, help us in different ways. So I think it all goes together, personally. I'm going to say, you know, I did my bit, right? I did my like inner work and like I have outer results too. It's really, really cool. So, so I can't promise weight loss with the recovery method, but I, you know, you will feel lighter within yourself. The support group that starts next week, it's an eight week program. It's not a drop in group. So it is a commitment that you make to show up every week to do the work because you end up getting partnered with generally with one person, sometimes with two people, and they need you to show up so that they can they trust you. You build a relationship and that trust. So you're also not talking like you're not sharing all your grief with like all the people, because that could feel overwhelming. It's just it becomes this one on one kind of connection that you really end up making. It's absolutely confidential. That's one of the commitments that we make every single week is absolute confidentiality. So that when you share what you, it is that you are sharing, it goes no further than that space. And it doesn't even go any further beyond than beyond the support group. Like, I've done this work, say, with a friend of mine, and one of the commitments I made to her is, because I see her often, is I said, what we talk about in this space is just in this space. Unless you bring it up, I will never bring up this relationship. I'm never going to ask you how you're feeling about it. I'm never going to, like, probe in there or anything. That's it, it's just within the space. <coughs> and so it gives you this safe, nurturing space to heal. And it's a really wonderful, wonderful gift that you can give yourself. In terms of the money stuff, because I like to talk about, I like to keep things up front <coughs> and transparent. So I was actually going to have just a set fee for this support group, and I was thinking about it today, and I was checking in with my, my own heart, and I went, no, I'm going to do it differently, because I want this to be available to anybody who's willing to do the work. And so I'm actually going to offer it at a, what I call a pay from your heart price. <coughs> so I have an absolute no <coughs> that um, basically will like pay the, we're going to be meeting in this building in the meditation room back there, so we'll be in this night. Nice room where people meditate in. I mean, the energy in there is great. Um, so we'll be in there. So to, in order for me to pay for the book, because you get a copy of the book, and you get <coughs> photocopies and handouts and things, and then also the rental for the space. So I have a minimum amount that I kind of like need to ask each person to pay, which is only $60. And then there's kind of like a, you should really shouldn't pay more than this amount, because, well, you can if you want, I guess. But so usually this, this support group, um, I feel a little weird talk, standing up here talking about the money stuff, but I will, I will keep going since I started, I guess. Usually the support group is offered for about $399, which to me seems like a lot. So I was going to offer it for about $200, $208 is the number that I kind of checked in with myself and came up with. So I'm just going to, I just want to let you know that that's how this is working. So if you choose to sign up for it, you can let me know when you sign up what amount is when you check in with your own heart, what feels right to you. If you're like, oh, this is way too overwhelming, just like pay that 208 amount that I was originally gonna offer it for. But I wanna make it available to people, no matter your financial circumstances, so that you can so that you can do the work to heal because this is something that I would be doing regardless of you know whether I was doing it professionally or not. I just think this is really, really wonderful, wonderful stuff. So, what else do I want to tell you? 
I'm almost done. I'm really actually almost done. So there are three different categories of people that tend the three different categories that people tend to fall into during their lifetime around certain topics. There are people who who want to want to make change in their life. Like you want to want to do something. You don't actually want to do it yet. You're like, yeah, I should want to do that. There's the people that think about it. There's the people that, you know, they think about like, oh, maybe someday, maybe someday I should become a runner, right? I, I want to want to become a runner. I don't actually want to do the things that will make me a runner, like run, but I, I like the idea of it. I think about it. I'm like, oh, what would it be like if I could run? My husband runs four miles every day at lunchtime, and I think that's awesome. And so I kind of want to want to be a runner, just thinking about this. You know, then there are people that talk about some things that they want to do. You know, they, they, talk, they talk about it. And, you know, they maybe probably know people who've talked about the things that maybe they want to do for years sometimes, since they first heard about the thing. They just talk about it, just not doing it yet. And then there's the third category of people, who are often the much smaller category, who want to make a change of some kind in their life so much that they're willing to get up and do something about it. The bottom line of recovery, recovering from grief, probably recovering from pretty much anything, is honestly assessing what category you are in and moving that way. So, I will leave that with you. Thank you so much for being here tonight.